Hey guys, um, today is just going to be a uh, little review of uh, some uniform circular motion ideas with some car crash videos um, and also a, uh, a little bit of talking about collisions in some of those crashes, in one of those crashes, and then a brief introduction to the idea of conservation momentum when we can say momentum is conserved, which will tie into our problem set that we'll have tomorrow. Let's see write this down here for you. We're going to be applying this to cars going around turns. And you guys still have access to my OneNote, so if you're ever looking for any of this stuff, you do. You can go click on the link. If you need the link, let me know. I can email it to you. Okay. So we're going to have a car going around a turn, and we're going to talk about the summation of forces along the radius. And for these turns, we're going to assume that the, uh, that the turns are unbent so that the force that will allow the cars to go around the turn will be the force of friction. So force of friction, and, and, and as long as we're not sliding initially, the thing that will allow us to try to go around the turn will be force of friction static equals m v squared over r. So sum the force along the radius. Otherwise, this is also, by the way, some of you have read and watched some stuff on this now. Um, summing force along the radius, I could have also written instead there f sub c, for centripetal force, but I have found that in AP physics and in physics, students find that confusing because they think it's an actual physical force. F sub C, the centripetal force, means sum the forces along the radius. You have to add up all the forces along the radius. Now, the good news for, for this class is that there's only going to be one force along the radius, but in the real world, there can be lots of forces along the radius. For example, if you had a banked turn, okay, um, you would have some component of the normal force along the radius plus friction helping you out. Um, so we're going to go ahead, um, and I still write that and emphasize that we are adding up the forces that are along the radius of our turn. Okay? So force of friction static equals m, and then for that special acceleration, we're going around a circle, we can put in v squared over r. And this is really a speed squared over r. We know the direction of the acceleration is in towards the center of the turn. Okay? Um, and, and even though I haven't been writing it, um, I always consider in towards the center of the turn to be the positive direction. So both, uh, if I only have one force... It'll be positive, and my acceleration will be positive, okay? All right, so now I'm going to expand out the left side there a little bit and write mu sub s times the normal equals mv squared over r. And since it's an unbanked turn, um, for the normal force, I can consider the normal force, that support force of the ground up, to be the same thing as the weight going down, okay? So I'm going to put an mg for the normal force. So mu sub s mg equals m v squared over r. And now you can see why I went to the trouble of doing this. The mass of the car cancels out. On an unbanked turn like this, with just friction acting along the radius, the mass of the car doesn't matter. Completely uh, uh, non-intuitive uh, or counterintuitive, uh, but the mass doesn't matter on what the car is, as long as we're not changing the surface. Way back to we learned about friction with the uh, friction melting with the ice skater and the curling and all that. As long as we're not um, changing the surface, because um, then the mass could matter about how we melt it and stuff like that. Um, but the mass cancels out here, okay? It does not matter, okay? Kind of like our inclined plane, will it move problem. The mass cancels out. So it really matters on whether or not we're going to make the turn, okay? Well, we've got the coefficient of friction, which depends on the surface that we're in contact with. G, which will stay the same. The radius of the turn, okay? And how fast we're going. So probably heard that if it's raining or if it's snowing or something, you need to slow down. That should make a little bit of sense now, based on this equation. I mean, it's already common sense, but let's say we've got some turn radius r, and uh, this will be our car. So our car is going around the turn. We're looking at it top down. Okay, we've got some r, and let's say you're taking that turn at the highest speed you can. Okay, so you're just going to barely make the turn. You're at that point where you're just about to start sliding. Okay, all right. And now, so you just barely made the turn. So we're going to keep this speed the same. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's rained. So I'm going to keep the speed the same. We just barely made the turn, okay? So what's going to happen if it's raining? This coefficient of friction is probably going to be lower, okay? So if we go the same speed, but we've made this smaller, this number over here smaller, it means we're going to have to take the same speed, and R is going to have to go up to keep the equation the same. We're going to have to divide by a bigger number, okay? so that this overall number can go down. Because if this side, left, left side equation is going down, the right side has to go down. Okay, so if I'm keeping this the same, what do we have to do? Divide by a bigger number 
to get a smaller number. So what does that mean for our picture, for our car? Well, now we carve out some new R. So instead of making the turn, we're gonna to go to a bigger radius and then we're no longer where we wanna be, okay? We're on the outside of our turn. We are in the ditch. We're in the snowbank if it was snowing. Maybe we've gone, hopefully not, but maybe we've slid into oncoming traffic kind of thing, okay? Um, so you do actually have to slow down when your coefficient of friction changes, okay? All right, so now let's watch this with much more entertaining fashion with a couple of videos. And I will tell you that um, the uh, drivers in these videos are both fine, okay? You are not watching anybody get seriously hurt or anything like that. And here is Petter. Okay, so before I continue here, you'll notice that they are on a gravel road here. This is some sort of rally racing type of deal, okay? Notice where all the people are. They are smart, they're on the inside of the turn because if there's not enough friction, we know that this vehicle will keep going straight. We need a force in towards the turn to make this go around the turn. If there's not enough force inward, it'll keep going straight. Now, if you're in that vehicle, you feel like you're being pushed outward, but in reality, your body's just trying to go straight and forces like the friction with the seat in the case of you, um, possibly the door, okay, um, will push you in around the turn if all goes well, okay? If all doesn't go well, that's why all these people are on the inside of the turn. Okay, so we'll go ahead and hit play. And that, Julian. All right, so what happens is they start to slide. And when they start to slide, a couple things happen here. If we go back to our equation. If we are on our turn and we start to slide, we no longer have static friction. As soon as we start to slide, we now have kinetic friction. So they were going too fast for that turn, but then things get worse. When they start to slide, instead of this being mu sub s, it's now mu sub k. It's that coefficient of kinetic friction. When we did all our friction stuff, we know that mu sub k is less than mu sub s. So now we have even la lower number over here. So we're gonna carve out an even bigger radius, okay? Um, now the, the problem with that, of course, is now we're off the road and mu is gonna go down even more because the tires are probably best equipped on that dirt road. They're probably not best on grassland or whatever they're, they're, they're into now. Okay, and then they went down the hill, okay? Let's go back and let it finish. Play. It's not the way he wanted to start the day. That's a bizarre incident. And they missed the road going by. And they hit a light pole or a power pole. Power line. Some hold against the electric pole, which is fall down. Oh my word! That guy's okay. Well, the good news is there that none of the spectators were injured, Julian. But it was bad news for Solberg. I see. He just he just seemed to run wide, didn't he? Here it is from the in car. That's that corner. Yari went wide on down into the ditch. Through. He's now powering through it to try and not lose momentum, and he's just gone straight across the stage without realizing it and straight into the pole. Just a bit too wide on this corner here, and we, just a bit too wide. Uh, we tried to find our way out, and uh, we, with the vines all over the front of the windscreen, we just did not see the road, and we've come a wee bit too far across the road and uh, hit the telegraph wire. So uh, our rally is over for today. All right, now, so here's the people on the inside of the turn again, which is a good thing. That's where they should be. We have the quality as much as we can here. That's all we got. All right. Um, and I'm going back again here. If I can pause at the right moment, this is a little bit where use my mouse. I can't get it with the stylus. All right, there we go, okay? So you can see they've started to slide. And as soon as they start to slide, we went from static to kinetic friction because when we're talking about the movement, it's relative to the radius. So if you start to slide along the radius, you go from static friction to kinetic friction in that direction. So that's that decrease in friction. And then you keep carving out a bigger and bigger radius because you have less force to go around the turn as a result. And then they hit the dirt. So the coefficient of friction goes down even farther, carve out a bigger radius. And then of course we got a problem because this is at Pikes Peak. By the way, if you ever get a chance to go up Pikes Peak, highly recommend it. Also um, in Colorado, that's in Colorado, um, Trail Ridge Road across Rocky Mountain National Park is absolutely breathtaking, okay? Um, Pikes Peak, uh, both, yeah, Pikes Peak is like a private thing, uh, the road here. That's why they're having races on it. Um, Rocky Mountain National Park has Trail Ridge Road. It's the highest paved connecting road in North America. This is the highest paved road, but it doesn't go anywhere. It just goes up to the top of the mountain, and then you come back down. You can also ride a, 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 a train up the, up the side of the mountain, too, a special type of train. All right. Um, but anyway, these people are on the inside. I hope that's not a person because they're not in a real good spot. Okay. But now we'll watch what happens after this. This driver was okay. He 
he walks yes. away from that, okay? Now, how could he walk away from that? That looks horrific, okay? Um, well, first of all, it rolled down the hill. It took a long time to come to a stop. So big time, small average force, and so you can survive that crash. Also, it's a racing car, it has a roll cage, okay? It's designed that if you flip through the air and roll a whole bunch um, and hit things like rocks, that the person inside will be okay. Um, but that'd be a lot, it's a lot better to crash like that in a race car than it is to like head on one of these boulders and then go like that and come to a stop. That would be much more likely to seriously hurt you than what just happened there, okay? Uh, all right, so now one more time, except this is the uh, in cam, roof cam, side cam view here. Side cam lasts a long time. Oh, that's way worse. And again, the guy walks away from that. Minor cuts and bruises. He's oh, the driver of that. Is oh, guy that car is okay. But there's a little bit of a review of our uh, whoops of our collision stuff. Okay. All right. So we have a little circuit motion review, little um, collision review. Now we're to the part where we're going to talk about when momentum is conserved. So for this one, you can go back to the uh, one note. And I'm going to make a new one note. I'll title this later. Um, Oh, I just saw that it wasn't syncing. Um, if you notice, if you're trying to use one of these and they're not syncing or whatever, just let me know because I can easily fix that. All right, so here we go. So when is momentum conserved? So we, we applied fat app, our F delta T change in momentum. We've applied this during collisions, okay? We can also talk about this um, when we're throwing something or when we're catching something. So if you think about throwing something versus kicking something, you can kick a ball just as far as you can throw it despite your... Um, a lot, well, a lot of you can. You could make that happen. You could throw them the same distance. But with the foot, it's only going to be on your foot when you punt a football for a split second. So if the time's really small, the force needs to be really big during that kick. If when you're throwing a football, if you want to throw it the same distance you kick it, you can't just do this and get it to go the same distance. You have to take it way back and do like, you know, let go like way out here and wind up because you want to apply a smaller force over a longer period of time to get the same change in momentum. So this does apply to um, collisions like we had with our car wrecks um, with the seatbelt. Um, this applies to throwing stuff. This applies to catching stuff um, during that. This also can be applied any other time because remember, it is a restatement of F equals MA. So now we're gonna not apply this during the collision or during the explosion or during the throw. Now we're gonna apply it another time. We're gonna apply it um, a split second before and a split second after one of those things happens. So we'll take a car crash example. I don't have the toy cars handy anymore. Um, ah, let me go ahead and grab two toy cars. We can do that. Be right back. I'm downstairs here, so there's lots of toys all over the place. Okay, all right. So here we have a car crash, okay? And we could apply this during the crash. But sometimes we want to know what happened right before the cars crashed or what's going to happen right after two things collide, okay? Obvious applications of this would include people that come out to the uh, traffic scene, traffic, uh, let's say traffic violation. The, the people that come out and investigate if there's an accident that has an injury. So if you've got an injury accident um, and someone's got it taken away to the hospital or there's major damage to something, someone's going to come out and investigate the crash scene, okay, for, for cars, for actual cars. And when they do that, they might want to know, they take statements, right? The police come out, they take statements, but they might want to know, hey, based on the science, you know, who's telling the truth or what is more likely that happened? You know, they want to recreate the events. So you might want to know what happened uh, in terms of like a truck. Maybe they said they stopped at the stop sign and it's obvious they didn't based on the physics of it, okay? And that physics would be the thing we're about to talk about, um, plus motion equations and, you know, maybe some other stuff too. Okay, all right, but mainly motion equations and, and the idea is it's gonna come out of this. So we have a car crash, okay? So during this crash, we can apply fat app, but we can also apply it right before and right after the crash. Now I'm gonna give you a simple example here um, of a car crash here in terms of when we do this, okay? So let's say this car's just sitting here and this car's gonna come up and rear end the truck, okay? So the car's gonna come up and rear end the truck, okay? So right before they hit, this car is moving in that direction. This car's not moving at all, okay? Um, so we have, overall, if we consider both cars to be our system, we have some momentum pointed that way, okay? 
right after they hit. The idea of conservation momentum is that this, these two objects, no matter how crunched up they get, no matter how many pieces fly off, as long as you include them in the system, okay? Metal, scraping on metal, um, all sorts of things tangling up. I mean, even a gasoline um, tank in here could explode, okay? And the momentum of the system, as long as you include everything that makes up these two vehicles, still has to point that way with the same exact amount, okay? As long as you do it a split second before and a split second after, okay? If you wait a while, the cars will slide and come to a stop. And we would have had momentum this way, and then after they come to a stop, there would be no momentum. So we've got to do this a split second before and a split second after. Now why? Let's go here to the equation. All right. So remember that that F, okay, is actually the external forces acting on our system. Our external forces in the case of this car crash would be something like air resistance or friction with the road, not friction between the cars. That's okay. That's an internal force. Okay, so the external forces, the outside forces acting on our system times the time over which they act has to equal the change in momentum. Okay, and remember this is a restatement of F equals MA. If I want to make this remote move that way and it's at rest, I want to make it accelerate, I exert a force over a time and I can change the momentum of the rope or uh, the remote, just like I can change the velocity. And we're talking, thinking about um, F equals MA stuff with an acceleration doing a change in velocity. So if I exert a force on here over time, I can change momentum. If that's an external force, that's going to cause a change in momentum. Now, for the car crash thing here, when we're thinking about it, it's both cars. So all the forces will be internal. All right. So what we want to do here is we want to keep the time really, really small. Really small for those outside forces. So when I was saying a split second before and a split second after the crash, that means while we have external forces, we have friction with the road, we have air resistance acting on the cars, okay? If that time is really, really small, even if this number is relatively large, okay, if we keep the time infinitesimally small, okay, make it 0 0.00000000001, even if we got like 500 over here, who cares? Because that you know moderately sized number times that absolutely tiny number will give you a value really close to zero. So close to zero, we'll say that that's a good approximation and we'll call it zero. So what does that mean? That means the change in momentum equals zero. Okay. Now that's how we will use it primarily in this class. We'll say split second before a crash, split compared to a split second after, the change in momentum has to be zero. Okay. Um, there are other cases. If there's no external forces, you could also claim the change in momentum is zero. But we do, in most real world situations, okay, for car crashes, we will have external forces. We're just saying they don't have enough time to act. Keep that time really small so they can't have an effect on the momentum of the system. Okay. So now what is this going to look like when we do our problems tomorrow? I'm going to give you some templates for this, okay? We're going to write, like maybe we have a picture of the car crash here, and we're like, okay, here's this car. Here was, I don't remember, one of them was a truck. Okay, here's that car sitting there. Here's before they hit, and then we'll have an after they hit, and we'll have this mess. We'll have wheels all over the place. There we go. I don't know, something like that. There's the after, okay? And we'll be able to say that the momentum before has to equal the momentum after, that's the big idea that we're going to be using, okay? And it comes from this equation. Now, when we do the templates and I work through this stuff tomorrow, I'm not going to write that equation. I'm not going to write that. I'm going to start here, okay? And to be perfectly honest, as long as you remember that if you do something a split second before and a split second after that you can apply this, you're fine, okay? Right before and right after a crash. The change in momentum would be zero, which means that's another way of saying the momentum stays the same because we got delta P equals zero. There's no change in this number which means before equals after. You've dealt with conservation ideas before, okay? In fact, almost all of your uh, high school chemistry stuff that you learned, um, whenever that happened, was built up around conservation of mass. That right before and after the chemical reaction, the mass, the amount of stuff, the stuff that was in the before and the after had to be the same. So you might remember, we won't be doing anything this involved for these problems. These are all gonna stay one dimensional and relatively straightforward. Um, you might have done something like where you did cross and drop and you're like, oh, I've got three sodiums over here. I need to have three sodiums over here. I need all this cross and drop and balancing with coefficients. That was all based on the idea that the mass before 
okay? Had to equal the mass after, that all the stuff that was there before had to be after. Here's another conservation idea, and this is a really powerful one. This doesn't just apply to car crashes. If you can make one of these zero or really close to zero, this applies to everything, okay? You can use this in astrophysics. You can use this um, uh, in, uh, in organic chemistry. You can, I mean, you can use this anywhere, this idea. Um, if, if you keep the external forces really, really small or zero, or you keep the time over which they can act really small, the change in momentum must be zero. In fact, this is, this is used on the scale of the universe, okay? Everything down to the molecular level up to the scale of the entire universe. Um, this idea is holds, okay? Um, and specifically, you'll sometimes hear people say linear momentum. That's the type of momentum we're talking about here. This is conserved separately over anything else, okay? So the problems will come tomorrow. So in terms of assignment today, um, I just need you to um, write a short paragraph explaining um, how your car goes around a turn, a flat turn, okay? In your own words, okay? Please, the only thing I'll say is please don't use the words, uh, use the word, the phrase centripetal force in your explanation. Don't use that, okay? Also, don't use centrifugal force. That's an imaginary force. Imaginary force. Don't use that either. So um, if you're talking about a force, say what the actual force is. So just explain briefly. You don't need any equations or anything. A paragraph is plenty. It's um, so like two, three, four sentences, something like that, um, on how your car goes around a turn. Okay? That's it. Long video, short assignment.